And just a reminder that the video will be recorded and posted under the MyMAE link for offline viewing. And um, also, if you turn on your cameras or ask questions, uh, please understand that your image and voice will be recorded. Um, so to introduce Ricardo, he holds a master's uh, in science in aerospace engineering um, and a PhD in applied mathematics, uh, which was obtained in 2007 from the University of Rome, Sapienza, Italy. He joined our department in 2004 as an associate professor as part of the preeminence initiative. And he, holds, uh, he currently holds one of the university's term professorships. His research interests focus on spacecraft formation flight, space robotics, and warhead spacecraft fragmentation flyout prediction. Um, based on those areas, he's authored, co-authored over 100 journal and conference papers. And his work on, in that area has been uh, recognized by a number of awards. Uh, most significantly, uh, Ricardo uh, won an AFOSR Young Investigator Award in 2012 and, and <laughs> an ONR Young Investigator Award in 2013. He's also won other awards like the 2014 Dave, Award, Dave Ward Memorial Lecture Award from the Airspace Controls and Guidance Systems Committee. Um, he's worked, his work is impactful for, for many different areas, but especially I'd say for the Air Force. Um, and that's evidenced by the fact that he's spent uh, four different summer fellowships working with uh, AFRL. Um, in 2012 and 2015, he worked um, summers at the AFRL Space Vehicle Directorate. And in, in the last two years, 2019 and 2020, he's uh, been at Eglin Air Force Base. Um, he also plays a significant role in the autonomous space systems aspect of our department's um, AFOSR Center of Excellence. So with that, Ricardo, I will hand it off to you and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Warren, for the introduction. I assume that everybody can hear me and see my screen. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present some of the work that we are performing at the Advanced Autonomous uh, Multiple Spacecraft Laboratory, or ADAMOS Laboratory, which is the group I direct uh, in MAE. This is a topic um, that has been with me for over a decade now, uh, and it's still very productive uh, publication and funding-wise. We're actually going to potentially fly some of the ideas that I'll show you today on an actual spacecraft next year. We'll talk about that. And above all, it's still a lot of fun. So to, the idea is uh, to maneuver small satellites, uh, but also not so small satellites uh, in low Earth orbits, below 700 kilometers, where there is still some residual atmosphere by exploiting differentials in the uh, resistance that they encounter from the atmosphere. So that's why we call uh, differential drag the force that we want to use. And one of my PhD students, uh, Camilo Riagno, who's a Fulbright fellow, uh, defending his PhD in a couple of months, has been using adaptive control and uh, integral concurrent learning, or ICL, uh, to maneuver and estimate at the same time these type of formations, and uh, so that's the topic of today's talk. Um, before I do that, these are the times we're living in. Uh, I wanted a group picture, and uh, this worked out pretty well, Zoom group picture. So we have here, if you can see my arrow, Anthony, Omkar, Tanya and Camilo are PhD students, well, three PhD students and a master's student, of course, myself here. And then we have uh, Mark, uh, Alec, Brian, uh, Jack, um, Nathan, Michael, Nicolo, and Marcus were undergraduate researchers. And then the last two, Dr. Fedele was a visiting PhD student with us and he's coming back in a matter of a few days as a postdoc. And the gentleman you see here that some of you may have met last year, uh, Mr. Feinberg, uh, he was one of my program managers at NASA, KSC, Kennedy Space Center, uh, in the past, then retired and became a, an adjunct faculty for us, a lecturer for the Space Capstone Design class last year, and now he's working uh, as OPS on uh, one of our uh, small satellite projects. So that's the team. What we do in the Adamus group, in a nutshell, is developing novel guidance, navigation and control, and also some estimation uh, algorithms for spacecraft and uh, spacecraft formations. And when I talk about formations, I mean uh, satellites that are in very similar orbits at distances of the order of a few kilometers, no more than that. 
And this is probably the first time that I add uh, the expression dynamical systems because of this uh, little bomb down here uh, and the very new research that we're doing on warheads. And I'll talk about that at the end in one slide. But uh, we operate on three levels. First and foremost is theory and simulations on a computer, uh, numerical simulations. We have a laboratory, laboratory setup uh, where we operate what we call spacecraft simulators. They are robots that move on a flat epoxy floor using air bearing technology. They are powered by on-off thrusters and the intent is to emulate uh, the very close proximity operations of satellites. Uh, we haven't used actually this uh, test bed in a couple of years since the last AFRL project with Stanford ended. Um, and I'm kind of ready to move to a different scenario. We have a new student on a graduate, NASA graduate fellowship who is studying a uh, landing of uh, uh, quadcopter-like vehicles on, on rough terrain. So I would like to cover this epoxy floor with a removal, removable uh, surface of that nature. But for now, let's say that it's not used directly for our research, it's used for teaching. I've used the test bed for one of my graduate classes. So now we're focusing these days in, uh, on, on point one and directly jumping to point three, which is actually putting together uh, CubeSat missions. For those who are not familiar, a one unit CubeSat is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. So they're really tiny spacecraft. You can build two use, three use. So you can, uh, of course, grow the size, but they're really, uh, you know, shoebox like uh, satellites. And we are building two that we have to deliver next year to NASA. So we're pretty busy. And this last one has to do with uh, machine learning applied to uh, fragment fly out, fly out of warheads. Uh, we'll talk about that later. And I believe this kind of new research uh, can be expanded to the problem of space debris, collisions in space between spacecraft, for example, explosions in space, which are events that we have already experienced in the past. And so uh, it's, it's very exciting to, to explore the, uh, this area as well. But today uh, I will talk about differential driving. So the first point will be equations. I'll show you how using adaptive control and ICL and Lyapunov theory, we can uh, at the same time maneuver the spacecraft considering them point masses with respect to each other and estimate the parameters, in particular the drag parameters of one of them that we will call the target and we will assume it's completely unknown. Then I will quickly show you the work in progress without any equations, how we are using the same techniques to control also orientation without using thrusters or uh, momentum exchange devices of any sort. And finally, what Camilo is focusing on these days, which is uh, combining the formation flying component of point masses with attitude of the satellite. So full rotor translational control in principle without any thrusters or, or classical devices. These are the two satellites uh, that I will briefly describe. Acronyms will be spelled out later, PATCOOL and D3. Uh, you know, a, a little note here, in the field of uh, spacecraft design and, and, and operations, CubeSats have been considered for a long time a source of debris. Uh, and it's understandable because their success rate is, it's been pretty low, about 50%, it's probably higher now, but many of them don't ever communicate, not, not even the first time with the ground after deployment. Uh, very rarely they have propulsion systems, so you can't really maneuver out of the collision. Uh, some may guarantee the re-entry and burn into the atmosphere. Uh, but you know, they are definitely a concern for those who launch bigger, uh, bigger birds into space. We are aware of that. And in fact, I'll briefly, mentioned, uh, I'll briefly mention the conference that I proposed a few years ago and I've been running for uh, two years now, the ICSSA, International Academy of Astronautics Conference on Space Situational Awareness. So that's one part of our concern about not becoming debris, and in particular, the D3 mission, as you will see, has to do with uh, controlled re-entry at the end of life. So we're, we're trying to build responsible uh, type of vehicles. Then briefly on the warhead work that we just started in August, and I will conclude. So why is differential drag and uh, information flying important? Well, uh, it is a fact that the space is kind of the new far west. Uh, it's, it's been for a while, and, and one could argue that, you know, during the Cold War and, you know, the race to the moon, uh, that the things were already, you know, competitive then, but now we have a lot more players. We have the private players. Access to space is much easier. So uh, the, the feeling is that is now, you know, the, the competition in space is, is here to stay. It's not going to be dictated by 
big projects like the Apollo one and the shuttle one, uh, we have not only the Department of Defense up there uh, from different countries, defense from different countries, but we have also uh, commercial operators of SpaceX and others are filing with the FCC to launch thousands of nanosatellites. So in this kind of new scenario, if you want to be a player, you need to have certain capabilities. And I'm listing the one that I care about for this presentation. Uh, the first one is resident space object identification. Uh, you may be close to another spacecraft that is one of your friends. It may be an enemy. It may be a piece of debris or an, a natural uh, piece of debris, an asteroid. And identifying uh, and knowing what's going on with that uh, RSO is important. So on orbit space situational awareness is key. And as we observe uh, satellites shrinking more and more uh, and tasks being distributed among several units, the ability to coordinate these formations is, is of course important. What we do in the long term, what we hope to do is to develop ways to maneuver these formations of satellites, potentially uh, being independent from classical thrusters and reaction wheels and the, the typical systems that you will see on a satellite, for example, in low Earth orbit with differential drag forces. Uh, in uh, higher orbits, it will be solar radiation pressure and we've done some work on that. It is a cost-effective way to maneuver and uh, you are also a little bit harder to be detected in principle. For LEO, low Earth orbit, um, the big unknown is the atmospheric density. And so with the approach that I will, I will show you today, we have tried to be uh, atmospheric density agnostic in a sense. So we, we try to be independent or autonomous with respect to this big unknown. In fact, we estimate uh, its effect on online. And long term, really, what we want to do is to uh, build the foundations for more and more complex multi spacecraft missions. This talk will focus on simultaneous formation control and estimation, as I said before, of one of the spacecraft's drag parameters, the target. The reason why I say that it may augment or substitute orbit determination that you usually do from the ground is the following if you're flying close to another object and you know your, your orbit, accurately, maybe from GPS, and you know the relative state with respect to the other spacecraft, so you kind of know its orbit, predicting, or at least the orbit at a certain time, predicting its drag behavior, which is the most important non-conservative uh, force acting on the satellites in LEO, uh, it basically allows you to predict what that object is going to do in the future. So this is the scenario that we're looking at. Uh, when we talk about formations of satellites, and this is just an example, one target, two chasers, it may be more, uh, we usually introduce the local vertical, local horizontal coordinate system. The uh, X axis is uh, the radial axis going to one of the satellites or just pointing to a virtual satellite. Doesn't have to be a physical one. The Z uh, axis is the direction of the angular momentum on the orbit and the Y is the cross product of the two, which in LEO, it's basically the direction of the velocity vectors. Uh, orbits in LEO are either circular or they eventually become circular because of the drag force. Now, the reason why I am depicting these satellites as uh, two U CubeSats with those surfaces in the back in a dark configuration is because one of our satellites, the D3, uh, standing for drag D orbit device, looks like that. So it's a two U CubeSat that has four uh, deployable and retractable surfaces. They behave like motorized measuring tape. They can extend 3.7 meters. And the goal is in intentionally uh, to change the drag force. Now this design was, fu was funded by NASA to only guarantee the orbit of the satellite within a certain time frame. And modulating the drag force, we also guarantee that the uh, re-entry interface, when things start burning at re-entry, uh, it's in a specific uh, location, longitude and latitude wise. But then we realized that uh, being able to actually independently control these surfaces, this system can generate desired atmospheric torques and gravity gradient torques. Uh, gravity gradient has to do with the fact that parts of the spacecraft that are closer to the Earth uh, experience a little higher gravity than parts that are further away. And so this drag the orbit device in this presentation becomes the DMD uh, in a sense, the drag maneuvering device, because we want to use it as a formation uh, control type of system. So this is the scenario. And uh, the big unknown, as I said, is the, the drag force. Uh, and that's the one I want to use as my control variable. So this equation represents the acceleration due to drag experienced by uh, one of the spacecraft. You see density of the atmosphere. There are several models out there that you can use. Uh, they are more or less computationally expensive to run on board the spacecraft. 
and there are publications stating that no matter which one you pick, uh, they have an accuracy that doesn't really go past 30%. So uh, they are really the big uh, source of, 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 uh, of error here. Uh, the other parameters are the surface of your spacecraft. You definitely know it for your chasers, not for the target. The mass, you know it for the chasers, not for the target. The CD, you could argue that uh, you can calculate that uh, ahead of flight uh, if you have time and, and enough you know, graduate students. We published a few papers that estimate the uh, drag coefficient in different regimes of the decay orbit for this specific spacecraft. Uh, but you know, uh, you can say that you know it for your chasers, but not definitely not for your target. And then the VR, the velocity of the satellite uh, relative to the medium, which is the atmosphere. This is very thin atmosphere, but there is still particles. And uh, here also you would make assumptions like you do with RAW. Uh, you may want to choose a model. In this case, what does the atmosphere do? You may assume that it rotates rigidly with the, uh, with the planet, but there is still an approximation. So I would say that that is also an, a source of, uh, of error or another unknown parameter. So density, uh, surface CD, mass, and VR can be all unknown for the target, uh, not for the chasers where we actually say that we know S and M for sure. So what do we do? We start from the, the biggest unknown, density. We can't tell something about it, even though we, want to, we don't want to run an NRL MSIS model or a Jackia Bowman model. We still know that on a given orbit, that in this case will last about 90 minutes, that's the orbital period at the altitude of the ISS. So around that duration, we know that there are day-night variations that the satellite experiences. And so we can capture that behavior uh, with these sinusoidal uh, components. Uh, and then we have three constants here that are my unknowns. Now, we didn't just come up with this model. This is uh, borrowed from a paper from Gaius published in 2015. So this has been proven to be okay, uh, to be a good approximation of the density that your satellite experiences for a few days. And so this is taking care of the density. In my developments, we will assume this simple model. Of course, you could do more. You can have more frequencies here. You can have more constants. Uh, and, and that is, of course, room for improvement. But that's where we start from. Well, the next step is how do I represent the relative motion here? Uh, the satellites are a few kilometers apart, no more. And usually what we do in this case is use linear time invariant uh, equations of motion. As you can see, they are uh, only in terms of X and Y, X dot, Y dot, relative position and velocity. We will leave outside of the, uh, the, 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 the conversation here, the out of plane motion. And this is a model developed by Schweger and Sedgwick in 2002. It includes some J2 uh, effects in average. The J2 effect is uh, related to the oblateness of uh, the Earth at the poles. It's not a perfect sphere. And so this is the model that we will use, a linear time invariant, uh, at least for the uh, controller's developments. And the UI is my differential drag control force. Uh, if imagine these two chasers, the, the two, uh, two space I'm sorry, chaser and target, Chaser has the deployable surfaces all retracted and target has them all deployed, the target is experiencing more drag and that will be reflected into a differential drag in the Y direction uh, for the most part. That's an assumption that is usually made. All right, so let's start talking about adaptive controller and ICL. What is the beauty of using integral concurrent learning into an adaptive controller is the fact that we will have unknowns and I will describe them later in the next slide. Uh, we can guarantee how much excitation is needed for our system to eventually converge in terms of state and the unknown parameters uh, in an exponential way uh, to, to, to the correct values or to the best that it can estimate. Um, so we'll see what that means. Uh, we start from this linear model, which I've already presented, and now differential drag, which I'm calling the auxiliary control input, can be defined as the following expression. So you pick a pair target chaser, you get the drag experienced by the, the target, everything has a, a subscript T, and the drag experienced by the i chaser, uh, everything has a subscript I, uh, while my actual control variable, what I actually can act on is U bar, which is the ratio between surface and mass. I'm not changing the mass of the spacecraft, so I change its surface. Uh, I can write in a more compact form that same UI by separating the known quantities from the unknown ones, uh, and uh, Y is a measurable regression matrix, theta would be my vector of uncertain parameters that I would like to estimate online. So as, you, as I mentioned before, for the target, I assume that I know pretty much 
nothing about the drug behavior. I don't know the density, and you see it in the three uh, parameters, D1, 2, and 3. I don't know CD, mass, surface, and velocity relative to the medium. I will not, in this version of the, of the, of the adaptation uh, that I'll show you, I will not independently estimate these quantities, but knowing what these products are doing is basically telling me uh, that you know how to predict the orbital decay and the, and the, the atmospheric behavior of the target. Uh, and so that's, that's really what, what counts, what's important. For the uh, chaser instead, as you can see, it's the same kind of unknown parameter, except I know S over M because that's my control. And so I don't have that. Okay, so this vector can be as long as possible uh, as you want, um, depending on the number of chasers that you have in the formation. Everything from now on that has a hat uh, is indicating an estimate of this theta vector. And so we start proposing that the, uh, uh, the control law is this expression is basically coming from the differential drag solving for a mu bar and, and considering that we have a linear system as a reference. So this Kx term is coming from a simple LQR uh, problem applied to this linear dynamics. And, and it's for now, this is, this is basically uh, all put together with estimates because that's, that's really what we have, the estimates of the unknown parameters. And finally, the adaptation law. So uh, theta dot, uh, theta hat dot is my uh, adaptive law. Uh, what's in this expression? Uh, first of all, the projection algorithm. Uh, you will see it here and then it will disappear from the rest of the, of the slides. It is being published, uh, the references at the bottom. It's basically what it's doing. It's checking the value of your parameter theta at the current time, the value of the theta dot that is proposed by the adaptation. And it's making sure that the parameters remain within physical bounds. We do know what the physical bounds of these quantities are. We don't know what exactly they are, but we know that the velocity of, an of a spacecraft in DO is about seven kilometers a second. So if you see a radial velocity that goes into hundreds of kilometers per second, something is wrong. We know how to constrain the masses. So we have reasonable values bounds for theta. And so that's all the projection algorithm is really doing. And it's been proven that the uh, stability analysis that will follow based on the Apunov theory is not affected by this algorithm. So we'll, we'll just take that as a fact. <clears throat> and uh, what's inside here is uh, a uh, uh, gradient-like term, the first one. And then this is the uh, uh, additional component now, the new one, the ICL, the integral concurrent learning term. So one piece at a time. Delta T is uh, a user-defined sampling time, 30 seconds. Uh, it's what you choose. Gamma is the adaptation gain. Actually, this will be shown in the Lyapunov function that we'll, I will introduce. KICL is another gain, if you like. It's a symmetric positive definite matrix. P is another symmetric positive definite matrix, also coming in the Lyapunov function that I will show you. And now these are the integral terms. What we are doing here is adding over a certain number of, of sample times, uh, delta t, these integrals. The first one is integrating the regression matrix y that we've seen before. And the second one, if you like, it's integrating what the dynamics, the free dynamics of the linear system, the term ax is doing. So what really they, they are trying to do is accumulate knowledge uh, about the system. Uh, and, they, and that knowledge is then used uh, at, a some, at some point uh, by the adaptation law to estimate, uh, to have a, an estimate of the parameters. Um, so one more step from here is using the fact that my dynamics was linear, so I can actually write this equality and simplify or I guess comp compact my uh, adaptation law with these uh, two terms here, the gradient-based one and the gamma K IC, uh, ICL and the summation over a certain number of sample times of the yi transpose yi theta t. Tilde represents the error between the real parameter theta and the estimate theta head. So how do we prove that doing all this, um, basically proposing this control law and this adaptation law, that the state is actually converging. And by converging, we can say that x, y, x dot, y dot, we want them to go to zero or to some other value. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can just offset everything. Uh, and that the theta tilde that goes to zero, so that we are actually converging to the real uh, products uh, that I defined as my unknowns. Well, we're using here uh, Lyapunov uh, analysis to, to, prove, uh, to prove that this, this approach is effective. This is a quadratic Lyapunov function of the error in the state and the error in the, uh, uh, error in the parameters. 
in the in the, in the parameter uh, of, of our nodes. We choose here to split the uh, control, the auxiliary control, as I called it, into a feedback term, which is again the minus kx coming from the LPR problem, and the adaptive control. Now the UI can be further expressed as y theta, as you may recall. And if I split theta into theta tilde and theta uh, est estimated theta hat, that's how it looks like. So you solve for UAD from this previous equation here by moving your, your feedback to the other side. And this is the expression that you get for the adaptation. Uh, we do know that y theta hat will look like this. And so by combining all this and taking the time derivative of the diagonal function, which we would like to have always negative definite in principle, this is what you're looking at. Uh, this term in parentheses here, uh, where you see this A star, uh, A star is A minus BK. It comes from the way I've designed my controller and it, it is an orbit matrix. So uh, its eigenvalues are always a strictly negative real part. We can basically say that this quantity here is always a negative definite as I'll show you in the next slide. And you have this additional term. Uh, so now if you substitute the uh, adaptive control, uh, this quantity, taking into account the estimates and the adaptation law that I proposed before. Uh, this is how your um, time derivative of the Diapunov function is going to look like. The first term, minus x transpose q1x, is just the same one that I showed you before, where I chose to write this entire parenthesis, p a star plus a star transpose p as minus q1. You solve for Q1 from this Diapunov equation. It's a symmetric positive definite uh, matrix as well. So this is always negative definite. And then you have to deal with the rest. Uh, if you substitute the control law, uh, the rest becomes a little more manageable and it's this term. So basically, the bottom line of all the algebra and substitutions that you have to make is that you will end up with a time derivative of the Diapunov function that has a term that is always negative definite, the first one. And the second one that is, we don't know. Uh, it is changing as we accumulate knowledge of our system. As time goes by, the number of samples uh, over which we're computing those integrals is, is growing. And so this is where the finite excitation condition uh, comes in handy and allows us to say that uh, we, we can measure how much excitation the system requires so that the theta tilde converges to zero. Basically what we're saying is the following, that there exists a time t capital T, uh, greater than zero, uh, where at some point, if you define the threshold, just a constant that is positive, uh, lambda bar, the minimum eigenvalue of this summation, of this matrix basically, uh, it's the matrix that appears in the second term of the Lyapunov function time derivative, it is finally going to be greater than lambda bar. If, so before that time T, we cannot say much about this quantity we can just say that we can upper bound it with zero. And if that's the case, I am left with this inequality for V dot, which is less than X transpose Q1 X. Uh, now, if you use Barbala's lemma and some other considerations that are in our paper here, you can show that this is not going to give you exponential convergence. All you can do in this initial phase is saying that asymptotically the state will go eventually to zero as time goes to infinity and that the error is a least bound that is not exploding. And this is the, the, the phase of your maneuver where you're basically learning. You are accumulating these integrals. The ICL term is accumulating integrals and you can actually switch it off in your controller. It doesn't matter at this point uh, because it's, it's accumulating knowledge up to the point of having that minimum eigenvalue being greater than your threshold. After you pass the threshold, then you can finally use everything because you can say that the entire V dot is uh, negative definite. A few more things to note uh, are the fact that we can uh, bin uh, X and theta till the physical parameters and we can bound them with reasonable values. Uh, we can write the following uh, inequality for the Lyapunov function at any given time where theta is a composite, composite state vector with X and theta tilde. So we can find some constants beta one and beta two so that after the initial excitation phase is over, you can state that your Lyapunov function is decaying exponentially according to this decay law, where lambda is the minimum eigenvalue between the minimum eigenvalue of Q1 
and the minimum eigenvalue of KICL and these, these medians. So really what is happening here is that after a certain period of time, capital T, we have enough knowledge of the system or we have excited the system enough that we can start using that knowledge to make uh, sure that both the state and the unknown parameters are going to exponentially converge to their desired values, which in the way I formulated the problem is, is basically zero because it's error in the state and error in the parameter. So uh, compared to other techniques uh, previously presented in literature, uh, persistent excitation was used before. In that case, uh, you would have a completely different formulation uh, of the adaptation law and the Lyapunov the, the analysis. Uh, but before this technique was introduced, uh, the amount of excitation that you really need to, to start estimating correctly your unknown parameters cannot be guaranteed a priori uh, and it cannot be verified online. Instead, in this case, we can, do, we can do both. And the user here can decide how big of a threshold this is needed to be. If you make it too small, then you haven't learned enough. And so you basically continue to, to excite the system even after uh, this, you're not really uh, helping yourself much and making it much, you know, much bigger than it should be. And it's a trial and error for every problem. It basically means, you know, taking a, bit, a little bit longer in converging, basically switching to this phase where everything is exponentially decaying. But uh, let's see how this works. Um, so I have a couple of scenarios where the X and Y plane is shown. Uh, the uh, X direction, remember, is the radial direction. So the Earth will be on the left of these plots and the Y direction is the direction of flight. The uh, target spacecraft that is unknown, but in simulation is basically identical to the other satellites, is sitting at zero, zero. And these are the initial conditions for six chasers. They are not just randomly selected, they are actual uh, orbits uh, that have been introduced that are slightly different from the one of the target, and these are the corresponding relative positions in LBLH. Uh, the units are meters, uh, so even though they are missing from the boxes, they are on the axis, and you see that some are pretty far away. This is 14 kilometers ahead. This is 16 kilometers behind. And the goal is a leader follow information. So I want to put the uh, three satellites in front of the uh, target, one kilometer apart from each other, and three in the back. The maneuver is performed successfully. It takes a good 70 hours or so to see the result. These are tiny forces. We're using drag. And the simulations are all performed, of course, with a full uh, no linear dynamics model, a density model that is completely different from the one I assumed uh, that I used to build my uh, vector of unknown parameters. And we achieve here in the y direction, as you can see, the separation of one kilometer. Um, and we go to zero on x and zero relative velocities. Uh, these are the surfaces that we are commanding to the different spacecraft. Before we talk about the saturation, this is the phase where you're basically uh, are maintaining the formation. You can't relax in a certain way because these objects are still one kilometer away from each other. So they still see some differential forces due to gravity and drag. So they still are flying, you know, distant from each other. So you still have to continuously adjust to remain in that formation. Uh, saturation. Uh, the analysis that I showed you does not take that into account. So it's via simulation that we verify that, that this is working. Uh, Future work could be including, of course, a different control law that um, takes into account in its own formulation, um, maybe with hyperbolic tangents and other techniques, uh, the fact that the control can saturate. But this is not what we have done, uh, at least for this work. So um, each maneuverable chaser, one thing to notice, is estimating that vector. Uh, each, each chaser is maneuvering with respect to the target. So it's estimating the unknown parameters of the target. Uh, and why are we looking at this in terms of the unknown parameters? So the, the blue continuous line is the real product of the unknowns for the target. And the other ones, the dotted lines, are what the different chasers are estimating. It's kind of making sense. Uh, it is definitely capturing the uh, general behavior. Some frequencies you may argue are missing. Uh, and there is a little bit of issue with the amplitude. There are two uh, points to make here. From a maneuver perspective, this is absolutely enough. It's successful. The spacecraft are doing what I want them to do. And uh, the reason why also we don't have perfect, or, or I guess we could have better estimation, uh, well, there's two reasons. One is I started with a linear dynamics, uh, and that's what I've used in my developments. 
And the density model only has three constants and one frequency. And so, of course, there is room for improvement there. And we're definitely going to look into that for the future. Uh, but this is showing that the, the idea is there and it is, uh, it is effective in maneuvering and uh, satisfactorily and, uh, and at the same time estimating unknowns for a spacecraft that is completely uh, uncooperative in a sense with respect to the chasers. So that was point mass to point mass. Uh, but as I said, uh, well, let me show you actually one other maneuver. Apologize. Um, uh, the rendezvous. So it's the same scenario. The target is a zero, zero. And the chasers are starting in slightly different uh, positions, but still in the order of tens of kilometers for some of them. Now they want to go to the target to, to rendezvous with it. So basically to overlap with its, its position. And so we want to see all these plots converging to zero, of course. And, uh, and we want to see that at some point the chasers stop deploying surfaces and they fly with the same aerodynamic configuration as the target because they are pretty much the same spacecraft. They are in the same location. Uh, and so they shouldn't really uh, need to create more differential drag. And the fact that they get so close, it is compensating for the non-linearities that I'm not capturing in my linear time environment model. In fact, you see that the estimation is slightly better in this case. Uh, but again, there are still uh, assumptions that I made um, that could be removed to make a better estimation. Uh, we're, we're pretty sure of that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very good estimation of the behavior of the target and the maneuvers are performed without any knowledge of the target itself. So enough of equations. I said that this system can actually maneuver not only the position. In fact, um, you know, we can generate different torques small torques, aerodynamic torques, by deploying these booms in a differential manner. And uh, by, for example, deploying two opposite booms and retracting the other two, you can obtain a pendulum-like behavior due to gravity gradient. And so we started playing with this idea. And uh, for example, if your target uh, or chaser, in this case, wants to orient its body axis B1, 2, and 3 with respect to the axis of LBLH, which is a rotating coordinate system, very slowly, but it, it moves, so it's a tracking problem. Well, you can actually do that uh, only using the gravity, the gravity gradient effect and the uh, aerodynamic torques from the booms. This is the quaternion error between the body axis of the spacecraft and the orbital uh, coordinate system. So we're pretty uh, accurate in tracking its motion without using any momentum exchange device or any other uh, mean like thrusters. These are the lengths of the booms that eventually converge to some values that, that continue to oscillate uh, because we are continuously tracking these, these orbits. And I, I, I'm not showing here what are the unknowns, but we have a lot more unknowns than before. We have the same vector as before, plus uncertainty in the position of the center of mass, uncertainty in the length of the booms, and so on and so forth. So you, you can be very creative with what you put in your uh, vector of unknown parameters. And the last step, is uh, well trying to put everything together. This is what Camilo is working on right now uh, and will be in his PhD thesis. It's trying to maneuver uh, the ready position and orientation remaining aligned with the LDLH basis at the same time. Uh, you see this is a chaser starting from uh, far away from the target and it gets there. So it's a rendezvous maneuver and both chaser and target are capable starting from incorrect all the angles in this case I'm showing they are capable of aligning themselves with LDLH and stay on top of it. So these oscillations for the other angles are because, again, we are moving with that rotating uh, basis. So these are, you know, each oscillation is pretty much an orbital field. So it's, it's very exciting. It's very promising. Uh, there is a lot more work that can be done, but this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this has been published already in several venues. Uh, let me talk about our spacecraft. Let's start with the one that has to do with what I showed you. So the Dirac the orbit device. Uh, as I said, this system was originally intended to only the orbit the spacecraft, and now we're using it as a maneuvering system. It's a half U subsystem. So we'll mount in the back of your satellite, uh, and it measures about 10 by 10 by 5 centimeters for deployable surfaces, uh, 3.7 meter long at the most. And it's patent pending. We've been approached recently by a company that may want to license this technology. It's pretty exciting because, as I said, there's thousands of nano satellites going up potentially. And uh, if we can maneuver them without relying on thrusters and, and guarantee that they come down at the end of life, that would be a good thing from the space debris uh, perspective. Uh, and, and so that's the first satellite uh, due for uh, the 
delivery to NASA uh, at the end of 2021, the same for the second, same kind of uh, timeline. We're pretty busy, we're building two of them. Uh, this is a 3U satellite, its name is Passive Thermal Coding Observatory Operating in Low Earth Orbit, or PATCO. In this case, we have four metallic samples that look like coins. They are under these openings on top of the satellite. Two are coded with state-of-the-art uh, paint uh, that isolates uh, metallic surfaces from uh, thermal shocks, from the heat of the sun and the cold of deep space. And the other two are coded with a new technology, new coding that NASA KSC, Kennedy Space Center, wants to test. So we are building the entire 3U CubeSat that is a thermal experiment. So there's a lot of thermal considerations in the way it's built. It needs to be oriented always away from the Earth so that these four openings are either facing the sun or deep space and they are shielded, the samples are shielded from the Earth's radiation. Uh, so as I said, both will be launched uh, from ISS. They were selected from the CubeSat Launch Initiative, which is a NASA program uh, taking care of putting you on a rocket. The rocket goes to ISS. The astronauts put, it, uh, put you inside the NanoRacks deployers, and when they have time, they, they kick you out. It, it is not funding that goes directly to the faculty or the university, but I believe that they cover costs up to 300K per CubeSat. So it's a, it's a pretty involving program. And uh, so we're very excited to do this. Uh, small note, uh, when we were still allowed to travel back in January of this year, uh, I went to uh, the conference in Rome on CubeSats organized by the International Academy of Astronautics and uh, presented a poster that my students put together on PATCO and the poster won first prize. So it came back with some, uh, some cash for the students. This gentleman here is the Secretary General of the IAA and this is Professor Graziani. He used to teach me space systems back in 2002. So it's really a small world. Um, so as I said, CubeSats have been seen by people as a problem, a source of debris. We know that uh, my way of attacking the issue is gathering you know, experts from all over the world and creating a conference. I proposed to the IAA the uh, Conference on Space Situational Awareness, I think back in 2015. Uh, Mirnal Kumar actually was part of it and then left the project, but uh, you know, it's been going pretty well. I, I am chairing the conference that we had the first iteration in uh, Orlando in 2017. Second one was in DC again, when we were able to travel in January of this, uh, of this year. And the next one, COVID permitting, will be in uh, Spain, uh, hosted by GMV, Grupo Mecanica del Huevo. Again, small word, this is a company where I worked in 2003 for a year. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to go back there, hopefully. And uh, finally, the uh, new project that we're taking on, this is an AFOSR project that started August 1st. And it came out of my two, you've heard that I've done several fellowships with the Air Force. Two of those, the last two were at Eglin Air Force Base. So I spent summer 19, and then actually the fall after that, and this past summer, working with uh, Dr. Jerome uh, at, uh, at Eglin. And I was approached with this question. Uh, we in the Air Force have, a lot of warheads that uh, we test, uh, we detonate them uh, in static arena tests, they're not moving, uh, we blow them up, we have uh, now ways to capture the motion of the fragments with stereoscopic vision so we don't even collect the fragments anymore which was very tedious and not precise. So we have new technology to characterize how these fragments behave from a static test. How do we predict what this weapon would do um, if it's actually in motion? Uh, and so this became a collaboration with, among myself, you know, UF, AFOSR, uh, AFRL, the Navy, because the Navy is now uh, providing us with high fidelity numerical simulations. What we're doing, we are using machine learning to combine the very sparse experimental data that they give us, the Air Force gives us, from, with numerical simulations and try to extrapolate what the warhead would do uh, in real life. Of course, the ultimate validation of what we're doing will be an actual dynamic tests and hopefully those will come soon uh, but we obtained some interesting new results and I just submitted a paper to the Defense Technology Journal. It is very very interesting what they do uh, with these systems. Uh, they have warheads that date back to the 70s uh, that are stored uh, in Utah for example and every once in a while they, they CT scan them. They can create precise uh, models of the warheads including the cavities in the explosive and then they they blow them up, of course. And I do think that this type of work that the Air Force is doing and that we are doing um, 
can have logical overlap with the problem of collisions in space and, and space debris formation. Uh, but honestly, I couldn't find a lot, of, a lot of literature about this overlap. There is this one paper that sounded very exciting, examples of technology transfer from the uh, SDIO kinetic energy weapon lethality program to orbital debris modeling, but it's just uh, descriptive. There's no equations. So we are excited to take this problem uh, and we'll focus on warheads, but I see the future of this also for space debris. So hopefully we will expand. And uh, well, those who pay the bills, uh, everything that I presented, of course, has come from the students, but someone is paying. Uh, we've had mostly defense and NASA funding and some state funding in the past. Right now we have NASA funding our CubeSats and the deployment of the CubeSats, plus a brand new uh, graduate student fellowship uh, focused on uh, landers, um, landing on the moon, landing on Mars. Uh, as uh, Warren mentioned at the beginning, I'm one of the co-PIs on the uh, Assured Autonomy Center of Excellence uh, uh, from the Air Force R. And uh, the uh, work that I presented today is funded by, by uh, this, this program and the brand new Air Force R project uh, on, on war, uh, warheads and machine learning. And an interesting fact, a few weeks ago, uh, a singer from uh, actually the lead of this band, the Universal Hall Pass, never heard of them before, uh, she approached me because they have a song called The Orbit. And uh, she asked me if they could use some of our graphics. Uh, of course, the butterfly is not from us, but the, uh, the, the white lines you see there are some of the plots for, uh, you know, a three, a 12 YouTubes as decaying at different, uh, um, different surfaces deployed. So uh, I thought it was, it was interesting. I, I don't have the song. I'll let you know if it's good uh, once it comes out. And, uh, you know, Finally, I'm going to repeat what I've done. Usually, you know, you tell people what you're gonna do, you do it, and then you tell them what you've done. What we have done is successfully show that adaptive controller, uh, controllers and ICL can be uh, maneuvering precisely these formations of satellites and estimate at the same time what an unknown target is doing. Uh, these results are, in our opinion, implementable on small satellites, the primary goal of the D3 mission is deorbiting, but we think that some of what I showed you can be added as part of the mission. So hopefully some of these algorithms will fly and uh, we promise to be good citizens, of course, of the LEO, uh, not only through conferences, but through the spacecraft that we design. And these are some of the publications that uh, we've had in the last uh, two, I think, two and a half years uh, on the topic uh, that I presented. With that, I think I've taken enough of your time Thank you all for the attention. Let me know if I can clarify anything. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. Um, so, questions? So, uh, Ricardo, I, I had a couple of questions. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so, I've been hearing a lot um, by by different stakeholders that very low earth orbit is going to become uh, more of a focus by the air force and nasa so uh, these drag uh devices um how would they change or or alter from operation in leo to v, v leo well um, does this uh, if i remember correctly uh, the, the, the drag the orbit device, uh, the, the thickness of the booms and the maximum length, we computed that they start bending and really not being usable at about 120 kilometers. Um, so this system in particular, we were hoping, we don't know yet because we haven't flown it, so only then you will know, uh, but we're pretty sure that it should be able to handle altitudes that are you know, very low at orbit. Uh, and then past that 120, really, you're not you're not even orbiting anymore; you're just burning. But uh, it, it could be it could be applied. Um, other techniques, other devices that I'm aware of, we we did when we were justifying the patent application. Of course, as you can imagine, we've done a lot of uh, analysis of what's out there. Um, I would stay away from sales just because we worked with uh, NASA Ames for for some time, and actually they have one of our D3 is sitting there, they may launch it as well. And at some point they did deploy some kind of sail parachute system um, and it, it, it tangled itself up and it just they lost the mission. Deployables, maybe, 
Uh, they are, you know, anything that has a shape that you can control, I would be, uh, you know, entertaining the conversation of using it in, in very low Earth orbits like this or deployables uh, that, no, inflatables, that's what I meant, inflatables, but other, other systems, not so much. And then I know that um, you focus a good bit on space robotics, um, which, which I'll naively include um, servicing of, of other satellites and maybe deorbiting um, debris. Um, I guess in those kind of applications where your satellite will, will couple physically with another satellite, you could use these same kind of um, adaptive identification strategies to um, interrogate those satellites and maybe learn something about their dynamics, I guess, right? Once, once docked? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I think the, uh, the, you know, I didn't show any equations here, but you know, the work that Camilo has been doing with the, uh, uh, with the Torx, uh, once you are attached to it, then you become a, you know, a single system and you can start exciting yourself and the, the docked spacecraft and you can start estimating location of center of mass and some, some of the properties because you now have the luxury of actually exerting torques on an actual system. That's, yeah, that would be an interesting problem, yes. Other questions? I think there's something on the chat. Let me see. Oh, no. You can raise your hand. Mm. Will it show to me if people raise their hand? Um, yes, it will, and I don't see any, and there are none in the chat. It was either too clear or too fast. <laughs> All right, well, we'll give a second if there's any last minute questions. Um, we'll, we'll give time for that, but, but otherwise, um, as a reminder again, um, if colleagues you know, mentioned that they weren't able to attend or, or ask about the seminar, uh, please remind them that um, it is recorded and, and it's under the My MAE um, link uh, so they can view kind of asynchronously, so. Okay, well with that, uh, Ricardo, here's a virtual um, applause for a great job. Thank you. And, um, and um, we'll end the meeting there. Thank you so much, everybody.